There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. Before I delve into the records, um, I want to tell you what I'm going to cover. Uh, why the records were created, what was happening in China and the United States before the act was passed, the dates that the act existed, and who was exempt from the Exclusion Act, uh, and the paperwork it created, and where to find the files. And I'll show you lots of examples. And at the very end, I'll show you a, a case study from Southern Oregon. So there, there'll be names and places that you might be familiar with. The purpose of the act was to uh, limit the number of Chinese coming into the United States and to prevent the Chinese that were already here from being naturalized. There were several things that led up uh, to the Chinese coming to the United States. The 19th century was very chaotic in China. Between 1802 and 1840, the population increased 300 million people to make it a total of 400 million. Uh, China's Great Recession started in 1838 and lasted a century. There were floods, earthquakes, fires, and drought that brought further devastation to the country. And there were uh, several opium wars. The Chinese government imposed high taxes on the peasant farmers, and they were unable to pay the taxes and lost their land. And then they were unable to find employment in the industrial uh, sector. Between 1840 and 1900, 2.5 million Chinese left China for other parts of the world. Most of them um, went to other places. Uh, only a few went to California. But they believed the stories about Gold Mountain, and they heard about the gold rush. So they came over to the United States. In 1870, there were 34,000 Chinese in California. This is a map of the region where most of the unskilled laborers came from in China. It was called the Pearl River Delta. The early Chinese immigrants before 1850 uh, were usually re well received in the United States. They were wealthy, successful merchants and uh, skilled artisans, and there weren't that many of them. But, um, after 1850, uh, the unskilled laborers started coming, and they had low wages. The Chinese had learned about the gold rush from labor brokers who distributed circulars in port cities in China. Uh, the poor peasants couldn't afford to pay their pas passage to California, so um, there was something called labor contractors, and these brokers would pay the passage, and the immigrant had to pay the amount back, plus uh, extremely high rate of interest. And so the Chinese thought they were coming over for a short time, but the um, loans were so high with the high interest, they ended up staying longer than what they wanted to. They worked in the gold mines and built the railroads. And eventually, they went into canning and the timber industry and laundries and restaurants and small factories. The Chinese would work in the, the mining claims that the white miners had given up on. And because they worked so hard, um, everybody thought that they were accumulating a lot of gold. So that produced a lot of resentment. And they also took other jobs as cooks and peddlers and storekeepers, and um, which were usually uh, the Caucasians didn't want, or they were considered um, too dirty, or just they weren't interested in them. So there were low wages, they were working for low wages, and resentment just kept building. <laughs> 
there was a demand for exclusion. And once the gold was mined out and the railroads were built, the economy got worse. Uh, the Chinese could be pitted against and used to discipline white workers. If the white workers went on strike for higher wages, the Chinese could be brought in for lower wages. So using the Chinese laborers brought the wages down for the whites and the Chinese. It was a way of holding the, ch the white workers in check and resulted in more antagonism. Ironically, it was an Irish, a recent Irish immigrant who uh, led the anti-Chinese uh, movement in San Francisco. So there were boycotts and physical attacks and social ostracism. The unions required a union label for all their products and they wouldn't let the Chinese join the union. So that created more problems. There were anti-Chinese pamphlets, articles, political cartoons, essays, and, and novels that were all advocating exclusion of Chinese immigrants. And if anybody has ever looked at an uh, early newspaper, like from the 1800s, from the 1880s or early 1900s, it was, um, you could say anything in the newspaper. And they did, it, and it was pretty awful, the things that they would say. So, so finally, in 1882, in May, uh, President Chester A. Arthur passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it se severely curtailed Chinese immigration to the United States. The act suspended immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years, permitted those Chinese in the United States as November 17, 1880 to stay, travel abroad, and return. There was a special exemption for merchants, teachers, students, and travelers, but they needed a certificate from the Chinese government to prove their status. The Exclusion Act was the nation's first law to ban immigration by race and nation or nationality. Uh, the law pr prohibited Chinese residents, no matter how long they had worked here, uh, from becoming naturalized citizens. There were many laws after that that excluded more people, but, um, but I'm not going to go into those. <laughs> There's just too many of them. <laughs> so even after the act was passed, there was uh, violence and riots. Um, there was a massacre in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and in Hell's Canyon, Oregon. There were riots uh, all over Washington State where the Chinese were, and in Denver and Los Angeles, almost any place where they had a Chinese population. The act was only for 10 years, so in 1892 when it expired, they, they passed the Geary Act. And that extended the act for another 10 years, and it required Chinese aliens to register, to carry a certificate of residence with them at all times under penalty of imprisonment or deportation. Uh, the Chinese Americans challenged the constitutionality of the act, but the US Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional. The act was renewed every 10 years until 1943. So it was in effect for 61 years. So I'm gonna tell you about what's available at the National Archives in Seattle. So these are going to be examples of things that are found in the file. This is an, a certificate of residence. And in 1892 with the Geary Act, this started to be required. Uh, it has the file number, the name of the person, his application number for this certificate, his age, occupation, physical description, which included scars that um, a person could uh, kind he might look like somebody else, but if he had a scar, uh, that would really tell 
identify who he was. It, it would be hard to fake a scar. And so that's the reason they did that. And uh, it was the form was signed by an in individual and dated, and the place where the application was made uh, was noted on it too, and his his photo. This is an example of an early interrogation. He it has his, the ship name, and his name and the date, and where he was from, the company that he worked for. He was. Uh, living in Butte, Montana, worked for a company there, his age, his height, and it says he had no marks, no scars, and he did not speak English. Um, but he got a favorable report, and it was signed by the inspector and dated. And this was before they had more formal interrogations. As each time the law uh, was renewed, uh, it, the, um, it became stricter. They had more requirements. This is a 1902 Perchant, Merchants Partnership list. They allowed uh, merchants to come in, but they had to prove that they were merchants. This one tells uh, all about him. He was a merchant in San Francisco, and the name of the company, and what they sold. They had 28 partners and uh, for a total investment of $70,000. And it tells how much each partner had invested and where that person was living. Some of them live, were in China, and some of them were in San Francisco. But the $70,000 is worth uh, almost $2 million in today's dollars. Any person of Chinese ancestry, even if they were born in the United States, was required to register. When a person left the United States, whether it was to go to Canada or China, they had to register. They needed to submit papers that would prove who they were. And the burden of proof was on the Chinese person. And they did it so that they could get back into the country. It was okay to leave, but if they wanted to come back, they had to have this paperwork that had been approved. So as the, every time the law was passed, uh, there was more paperwork created. The, uh, the, they had the name, age, other names, and we'll talk about other names later, physical description, extended family information, the place and date of birth. They would ask them other questions about their wife, their children, the village, and neighbors. Um, and then there was a photo. They, uh, they took a photo before they left the country, and then they would compare that to the person coming back in. And even though it was um, a very degrading thing that they were doing to these people. It, it, the files have a lot of genealogical information and are very valuable to the families. Uh, they were interrogated every time they left and every time they came back. And this is an um, example of a process of a file. Not every file would have this information in it. But, um, but a lot of them do. And I'm not going to go over all the things listed here, just some of them. This is a section of an affidavit by Chin Ji He. He was a well-known businessman in Seattle, Washington. And his nephew wanted to get his papers, so his uncle testified for him. It uh, gave the name of the applicant uh, and the name of the person swearing the information, their relationship, his place of business and residence. His nephew was living with him at the company in Seattle, Washington, and he had lived there three years. Chin Num Sik was born in Eureka, Nevada in 1880. That's, that was the nephew. 
Uh, and that was before birth cer certificates in Nevada. So he had to prove that he was a U.S. citizen and they didn't have any birth certificates. So that made it difficult for him. And so he had several affidavits. Uh, he had some by, uh, by white people and some by Chinese. And since this man was one of the most well-known people in Seattle, this affidavit was very valuable to him. And the affidavit also told uh, the name of his father and where his father was working. He was in Butte, Montana. And then a couple years later, um, he finally gets his discharge papers from the court. And uh, that was an official document that said they believed the information that he was a U.S. citizen. And, um, and from those papers, he could get a certificate of identity. And I'm going to show you an example of that later on. But it was a, a form that would have been a lot easier to carry around than pages and pages of uh, a legal document. But th the discharge paper uh, also meant that he couldn't be arrested anymore for being in the United States. It, he was a citizen. He was OK. And when it also says uh, he was discharged from custody, which means he was in jail. He, he wasn't, you know, they were, weren't just holding him someplace. He was in jail until this was proven. For two years? Well, no, he, uh, not for two years. But I don't know when he started this process, but um, probably a month or two. Oh. Yeah. So he left the country, I think, five times. Uh, his file covers five different times. And this was one time when he was coming back. So uh, he had to go through the uh, questioning every time he came back. This tells uh, the same information, name, age, place of birth, marital status. It has the the status of his wife's feet, if they were bound or natural, and the number of times he was out of the United States, and the number of children. They wanted to make sure that the children's ages coincided with the times that he was in China. And um, also, they asked about the parents and siblings, and what his business was. And this is another uh, pre-investigation for, he wanted to leave the country again. So it says it's an application for an alleged born um, uh, Chinese. So even though he's um, proven that he's a US citizen, he's still called an alleged citizen. And it might just be legalese talk, but I think it's pretty offensive. But there are also uh, important numbers uh, that I've highlighted here. The, his uh, certificate of identity, and he has other numbers that could be important in trying to find his file later on. This is a collage of the file, the photos of him uh, for 15 years. Uh, his first photo, he has uh, the his head was shaved in the front and he has the cue. But he has he's wearing a suit in all of these pictures. He was born in the United States, so he probably didn't wear the traditional Chinese uh, uh, suit. But also the photographers would try to take people's pictures of them looking at their best. Few women immigrated uh, to the United States uh, because it was too costly to accompany their husbands, and the men thought they were going to be gone for a short time. Uh, it was supposed to be a, a temporary situation. And women of all classes were regarded as inferior to men and were expected to remain home and take care of the, the family. And the U.S. immigration laws discouraged wives from coming. 
they had rigorous interrogations and cross-examinations by U.S. officials in China. And uh, if they made it through that process and came to the United States, then they would have to go through that process once they got to the United States. So it, it was pretty hard and very discouraging for women to come over. Um, the U.S. Um, had the laws because they were trying to prevent prostitutes from coming in. But it was intimidating to all Chinese women. And this, was, this um, is the ratio of males to females. In 1816, it was, uh, 1860, it was 19 to 1, and by 1890, it was 27 to 1. Uh, so it was a bachelor society. There was a lot of illegal immigration to sustain the population. And so this created smuggling of people in and something called paper sons. And I'm going to talk about paper sons in a couple minutes. The uh, merchants were allowed to come in uh, under the Exclusion Act. And um, a man had to prove that he was a merchant and he could bring in his wife and family. Um, and this generated more paperwork because he had to have a testimony and passport, uh, testimony on the Chinese side and the U.S. side. He would usually have Caucasian business colleagues uh, do uh, testimony for him and partnership lists. They liked to interview Caucasians because they considered them more credible. But uh, the immigration, the laws were very restrictive and they kept getting worse, so the Chinese found ways to get around the laws. The smuggling in the paper suns. Uh, to be eligible for U.S. citizenship, a Chinese person had to be born in the United States or be the, the child of a person born in the U.S. Um, the federal law allowed merchants to return to China to reg who return to China to register children to come over to the United States. Men who were legally in the United States might sell their slot for entry so that an unrelated child could be sponsored for entry. Uh, by 1900, there were only 6,600 and some U.S.-born male citizens. So the Exclusion Act was working. It, there were fewer Chinese uh, in the United States that were born here. And then the 1906 uh, earthquake happened in San Francisco, and that destroyed the vital records. So it created an opportunity uh, for the Chinese to claim they were born in the United States. All of a sudden, everybody was born in San Francisco. And so after a while, <laughs> the officials caught on to that. <laughs> but it took a while. This, this is a flow chart that um, shows how it worked. So they were, if they were born in the U.S., take a trip to China, uh, report that they fathered a child, whether they did or not, and, uh, and that created a slot. And then uh, they would prepare coaching papers to help that person get in. And then the, their a legitimate child or the paper child could, would come to the United States. This is an example of a coaching document. And it would have the answers to the questions that they thought the authorities would ask. It was usually based on what was asked when they left the country, uh, as far as they could remember. But sometimes they asked different questions, and, and the person didn't have the answer. Uh, there are a few of these that are found in the files, but not very many because the, the person coming over would probably destroy them before they got to the, the port. So 
Uh, the only reason these would still be in the file would be somebody forgot something or maybe their, uh, their trunk was confiscated or something and they found the information. So, but it's kind of exciting when we do find something like this. And here's an example of discrepancies in the interrogations. It was very important. Uh, they, uh, when they interviewed someone, if they thought they might be lying, they would uh, interview someone else in the family or a friend, and they'd put them in a different room, and then they'd ask them both the same questions. So then they'd compare the answers. If there were major discrepancies, they could be sent back right away. But this person, um, these are, I would consider, minor discrepancies. But there were a lot of them. Uh, and plus all of these, there were nine more in the file. But they were all kind of like this, kind of picky. And uh, so it was up to the interviewer to decide if these were important enough for, to, be, uh, to send the person back. And this person made it through, even though they had all these discrepancies. And a lot of times they would ask for maps of the house or the village or both. This uh, is a map of a house. And once again, they're drawing the maps in one room and somebody else in the other room. Uh, they wanted to know where everybody slept, where the clocks were in the house, um, where, how many steps to the well, things like that. How many windows, so things that we wouldn't even know about our house, so. so. And then they'd have maps of the villages that uh, they would, the interviewer would say, who lives in the fourth house in the eighth row? And uh, they would have to know and know that person, know the wife, know the names of the children. And they just asked all kinds of questions like that. But these are great things to find in the files, especially for a descendant of the, of the person that the file is for, because they would know where the village was, they would know what that person's house looked like, and where they lived in, to, in relationship to everybody else in the village. So the typical information in the file would be the port of arrival, the date, the vessel name, the date admitted, uh, rejected, or deported, the subject's name, the place and date of birth, physical ap appearance, occupation, names and relationships of other family members. There might be a little family history in there and photos. The early files uh, didn't have photos, but the later ones did. And uh, there are lots of interrogations, the certificates of identity, maps, and um, occasionally there are birth, uh, marriage, and death certificates. It, later on, when uh, the, their, their Chinese people started having children in the United States, if they wanted to take those children back to China, uh, they could just produce the uh, birth certificate, and that was an easy way to prove uh, th that they were their children were U.S. citizens. And those documents are usually in the files, which is very nice. And um, as far as marriage certificates, they wanted to make sure that the couple was married. And so sometimes before they left China, they would get a marriage certificate. And it might not be for when they got married, but it would be an official uh, marriage certificate that would be good enough proof. And then sometimes that when they came over to the United States, they got married again in whatever state they were in, just to make it easier that the authorities would believe the information that they had. This is an example of a certificate of identity. It was about this big. It was on sturdy paper. It had on the back of it, it had the certificate number and it had um, like an eagle. It was um, kind of like a dollar bill. It, it had um, 
different things on it so that it wasn't easy to uh, make, uh, make a counterfeit copy of it. And uh, on the front, it had a picture that was adhered to this tough paper, and it was something that they couldn't take off and put somebody else's picture on there. Uh, but it had lots of information on it. It had his name, age, his uh, height, his, uh, his occupation, and where he lived, his exact address. He lived, this man lived in Boston. He came in through Seattle, so he had a Seattle um, case number, but then he left from Bo Boston a few times, so he also had some Boston numbers, case numbers. They weren't, uh, they were probably duplicates of most of the information that was in Seattle, but if this was your ancestor, it would be good to get all the files, that uh, all those numbers, to find all the information you could on him. So also, he, it came uh, with a, a, a little case that it would fit in, and it was also made of the same material. It was uh, very sturdy, and the person needed to carry it around with him. He could keep it in with his, his uh, suitcase back at the dormitory or wherever he was living, but he needed to have it handy in case the authorities asked to see it. Well, there were many important numbers in the case file, so if someone's looking for um, information, these, these numbers could help find the file. Uh, port arrival numbers and the court case numbers and certificate of residence or identity. And sometimes there's an alien registration number. And the names, uh, the Chinese, the traditional Chinese uh, names are the surname is first, and then the first name, and then the middle name. And when they got married, they had uh, the same surname, but they had a different first name and middle name. Sometimes they drop the surname and just went by those other two names. Uh, if it was a young person or someone who wasn't married, sometimes they would go by their school name. Uh, it, and it was a lot like um, Native American names that they had names for different stages in their life. Um, they also could have aliases. They could have Americanized names like Charlie Chin. And uh, it, it, if you're looking for a file, it's important to give all of those names uh, because the spelling uh, can be different. Even on one page of the file, <clears throat> they might uh, spell the name differently. And if anybody does genealogy, you know that you have to be creative with spelling. That a lot of times, whoever taking down the information will write it phonetically. So it's, it's even harder with the, the Chinese names. But <clears throat> one of the uh, inspectors got frustrated with the names, so he had this written up. He said uh, he found that the names Ham, Home, and Hum were easily interchangeable with Tam, Tom, and Tum, and that you and you were spelt differently, but they were the same person. And he was frustrated enough that he had this typed up and put it in a file that nobody else was going to see. So I don't know why he did that. <laughs> but it made it fun for us inter who were indexing the file. This was, is the last page in the file, and it's the reference sheet. Some of the files don't have any information on this, but this one is great because it has the um, name and file number for his father, his wife, six sons, and three daughters. So you have the file number, the name, and the relationship, and you can look for those other files with those file numbers. It doesn't tell you the city where the files were, but if you found this file in Seattle, you'd look in Seattle first for the other files. One of the, the last number is totally different than the rest. 
so it might be in a different city. This is a collage of the man that we've been talking about, and it's for 30 years. So the first four are, he has his uh, Chinese suit on, and he, and the first one he has his shaved head and the queue, and then he has American style haircut, and then it just, then the last two he has his suit on, and it just shows him aging 30 years. And you know, if that was your ancestor, it would be a wonderful document to have. Oops. Occasionally there are Caucasians in the file, uh, but they're usually, um, you know, customs officers, the, the um, interrogators, people like that. Uh, stenographers and they could be witnesses there's more likely to be Im more information if they were a witness um, and I've even seen pictures of Caucasian witnesses in the file but it, it's rare they're they're usually not indexed so if if your family if you knew they had a close relationship with a, a Chinese family and you knew the name of that family you might want to look in that file to see if they were a witness for them, but it would be the uh, looking for a needle in the haystack. So you'd have to be really motivated to do that. So finally, in 1943, President Roosevelt repealed the Exclusion Act. And uh, it was 1943, it was during World War II, and uh, China and the United States were allies, so it was an important thing for him to do and kind of amazing that it took so long. But when the law was repealed, it meant that foreign-born born Chinese had the right to become naturalized, the ones in the United States, and native-born Chinese no longer had to register to leave the country. But there was a more restrictive quota on the Chinese. Uh, early on, it was only 105 people. It was based on, it was a percentage of how many Chinese were in the United States. And um, it, that restrictive quota stayed that way until 1965, when the uh, Immigration Act of 1965 repealed. And the National Archives puts out this publication, uh, and it, it's in the handout. It's a PDF file that you can download, but it tells all about the, the history of the Act and where the files are uh, around the United States. So the records that I've been telling you about are in Record Group 85 for Immigration and Naturalization. But uh, there are Chinese immigration records in other record groups. Okay, this is where the files are located. So most of them are in San Francisco, uh, San Bruno outside of San Francisco. And then Seattle has the next most, it's almost uh, a little over half as many. And then New York City and Boston area and then Southern California. And then there are also files in the other um, National Archives facilities, uh, Chicago, Denver, um, Dallas, the, but not very many because it's fewer than, than these. So to find the files, um, they had to be in the United States before uh, 1945 or they wouldn't have a file. So, um, and then you would search by the names and the port arrivals. So, as I was saying, if they came into Seattle uh, and, and they lived in San Francisco, you would still look in Seattle. So, and for most of the people in Oregon, they came in through uh, San Francisco. They came early and they came through San Francisco and then came up to Oregon. Uh, and so the numbers are important for port arrivals and the, the court case numbers, the numbers that we talked about before, uh, and the residence and identity numbers. 
and any information you have, really. It could be um, siblings or friends, anything that you know about the person. And the best thing to do is to contact the archivist at the National Archives near the port of entry. And if you don't know the port of entry, just guess and start somewhere. And they will send you on to wherever you should go. You know, and it might take a while. And depending on if the person came in real early, there's probably not a lot of information. They really don't, uh, there's not a lot in there until about 1898. I'm going to talk about a local case. This is Toy Gao Fook, and I'm going to mostly call him Toy Gao. Um, this is a photo of him in 1907. He testified that he was 20 years old and that he was born in Klamath Falls, that his father was Toy Ki and his mother was Li Lane. Uh, his father was dead and his mother was living in China. He was applying to visit his mother in China and he wanted to return to the United States. So he, he also gave a sworn statement the same day that said he was born in January 1887 and in Jacksonville, Jackson County. So in the same day, he said he was born in two different places. But that could have been, you know, it's hard to tell. He, he could have misunderstood what the person was asking or, but that kind of sets a, a red flag up for the interrogators. So he needed uh, affidavits to prove his identity before he could leave the United States. So he got uh, Nathan Langle from uh, Klamath Falls, who was a resident of Klamath Falls from 1864 to 1904. And he swore in an affidavit that he had known the applicant's father in Jacksonville. Um, and that he knew the family for 20 years, and he thought that Toy Gao was about 20 years old. And then Wang Ying also swore in an affidavit. He said that he came to the United States in 1859 and went to Jackson County in 1860. He worked in the mines for over 40 years, and he was there when Toy Gao was born about 20 years ago. So this is an aside from that, but if you were looking for uh, Wong Wing, Ying, and there wasn't a file on him, if you uh, found this affidavit, you would have a lot of information on him. Uh, there were also there was a letter of recommendation uh, from all these people, uh, residents, local residents, that said uh, that he was a man of good habits, industrious, and trustworthy. And then another man, Robert Dunlap, uh, who was at the Oregon Soldiers' Home, swore that he was a resident of Jacksonville between 1854 and 1904, and he knew Toy Gook's family, his parents, that he saw the boy uh, from infancy until he was about 12 years old. And based on that inf information from all of those affidavits, uh, Toy Gao, Gao was able to get his certificate of identity. So with that certificate of identity, he was confident that he could uh, leave the United States and come back and be accepted when he came back. What is that? That is of the Oregon uh, Soldiers' Home oh. in Roseburg. And that's where the Robert Dunlap uh, was living when he, and he was almost 80 years old when he testified. So Toy Gao uh, went to China. This is a, a picture of the ship that he went on. It was the Empress of China. He left in um, 19, October 1907 and came back in September of 1908. He, he could only be gone for one year. So he was examined when he came back. Um, he arrived in Vancouver, B.C., and then took a, a train to Sumas, Washington, and that's where he was interviewed. 
So in his interview, there was the inspector, a Chinese interpreter, and a stenographer. And in his testimony, he said that he had lived in all these different places around southern Oregon. Um, he tested testified that he was married and that his married name was Hong Yim, and, uh, but people ta called him Toy Gao. He was born in Jacksonville and lived there for five years before moving to Medford. And then he was in Ashland for two years, and then Fort Klamath for two years, and then Klamath Falls for eight to nine years. He was a cook for the government surveyors and for George Pawn, uh, a Chinaman, and Mr. McMillan. So, in uh, he w he was held in the detention center when they were interviewing people. For some reason, they uh, decided to re-interview people. They weren't sure he he was who he said he was. And that the file does not say why they decided to go through this process again. But the inspector interviewed seven people on, on this, this list, so quite a few people. Uh, Dunlap, uh, who was in the sol soldier's home, had died in that year, so they couldn't interview him. But um, they interviewed Lango who uh, was actively preparing the case for him, and he secured all the information from the white witnesses. He said he lost track of the alleged native until he was requested by the applicant to prepare the affidavits, alleging him to be a native-born citizen. Uh, Langle uh, had not seen the applicant since he was very young, and he mistakenly called him Toy Fu, several times. So that, you know, made the authorities wonder too. And um, then, so they interviewed him again in October, and he said that he had known the boy um, many years ago when he was young, and that he thought he recognized him in Klamath Falls. So they had a conversation, and and that Toy Gao, uh, reminded him of who he was and that he had known him in Jacksonville and so he kept running into him all the time and he felt like he knew him and that he remembered him from from when he was a boy. Uh, they also interviewed uh, Yi Lang uh, who uh, said he was not the identical Chinaman that he knew. He knew Toy Ki, the father, and he had a son, Toy Fook, and he, he thought that uh, Toy Ki's son was older than this man who was saying, uh, Toy Ki Gao, who was saying he was Toy Ki's son. Uh, but Yi Lang said that Toy Fook had a wife and they were living near Portland. Uh, and he said the person in the photo was, um, was Toy Gao and not Toy Fook. Uh, the Chinese inspector looked for Toy Fook in Portland, but he couldn't find him. So um, Yi Lang gave more information. He said that he knew Toy Gao's father was really Toy Toy A Lung, and that he was born in or buried in California, and that Toy Gao had offered him a hundred dollars to dig up his father's remains so they could be sent to China. Uh, Yi Lang stated that Toy Ki was a different person and he was buried in China. So next they found two classmates that knew Toy Ki, um, or Toy Fook. Uh, they interviewed Christian Joseph Kenny, and he said he was a native of Jacksonville and still lived there. He was 25 years old. He attended public school in Jacksonville, and he remembered Toy Fook and his, his younger sister. Toy Fook could speak, understand, and write English as well as any of the other students, and he, he was very bright. He left Jacksonville when he was 10 or 12 years old. And Toy, uh, Kenny 
said that Toy Fook went to Portland and then to San Francisco. He didn't recognize the photo of Toy Gao, and he said, I believe the boy Toy Fook that I knew in Jacksonville was better looking than this party in the photograph. So, <laughs> um, Ernest Elliott also testified. He said he was 30 years old, a resident of Jacksonville from 1888 to 1897. He remembered the Toy Key family as a man, wife, and son and daughter. He remembered Toy Fook. He had a reputation of being the best English penman in the school. He moved when he was 12 or 13 uh, to Ashland and then Eureka. And then, and he's been living in Portland for the last six or seven years. He was a foreman at a cannery gang in Alaska and uh, worked there in the summer and returned to Portland in the fall. Uh, in about 1905 or 1906, he married a white woman in Portland. And she was a widow with a little girl and they lived in Portland at 17th and Overton, or Johnson Street. Um, Elliot visited with them once or twice a year, uh, and he stated positively that the, the papers of Toy Gao, uh, he was not the son of the Chinaman who ran a store and laundry in Jacksonville. Uh, and he said there was only one boy and one girl in Toy Key's family. So next, they found Toy Fook's teacher. Uh, Mrs. Charles Moore was living in Baker City, Oregon, and she testified that she was the daughter of Washington Newberry and formerly resided in Jacksonville. She was known as Miss Hattie Newberry when she taught public school there from 1884 to 1892. Toy Fook was her only Chinese student he was a bright pupil and the best pupil she had in penmanship. He had a little sister called Sook. And the last time she saw him was, uh, he was close to 10 years old. She said that he w w liked to bring her presents. He brought her uh, a, a shawl that was had fringe all around it and a red handkerchief. And Toy Fook's father uh, kept a store in Jacksonville. And about 1896, her brother, Gus Newberry, told her that Toy had come by their house and asked about her, and that he said that he had just gotten back from China. So there were more affidavits <laughs> in um, October of 1908. So his file is getting bigger and bigger <laughs> with all these affidavits. So Lu Lee Gay, who was about 54 or 55 uh, and lived in Medford, uh, said that he came before the railroad was built and he was a cook for Dr. Linton and, and Medford. He recognized the photo of Toy Gao uh, from his certificate. He had met Toy Gao six or seven years ago when Gao was a dishwasher in Grants Pass and he knew him as Gao and he knew his father was Toy A. Lung, who had died in California and was buried there. He also knew uh, Toy Fook and said that he was born in Jacksonville and went to Portland and married a white woman. And he did not know if Toy Gao and Toy Fook were brothers. Yi Lang, uh, alias Jim Ling, alias Bo Wa Lung, testified that he was a merchant and a member of the Bo, uh, Bo Wa Lung Company in Ashland. And he lived in the country for about 30 years. He knew Toy Ki when he first came to Jacksonville from California. And he said he had three children, two boys and one girl. One boy was born in California and never came to Jacksonville. The other boy and girl were born in Jacksonville. The boy Toy Fook was Toy Fook, and he first met Toy Gao in Ashland six or seven years ago, and he was definitely not Toy Fook. So there was also an affidavit from Wong Guak Kei, 
also known as Hua Chung, who was a merchant and a member of the Hua Chung Company of Ashland. He had lived in the county for about 25 years. He knew Toy Key in Jacksonville, and he knew that he had a son. He, he last saw the boy in Jacksonville when he was about six years old. So about 10 years ago, a Chinaman about 16 years old came to his store in Ashland and told him that he was Toy Fook, the son of Toy Ki. Hua Chung believed the story at the time, but now he didn't know if this boy was really the son of Toy Ki. It was really hard for these people to testify because they hadn't seen these uh, people since they were children and then they grew up and looked a lot different and yet they were expected to testify and it, it was very important for both parties, for the U.S. parties and for the Chinese, for them to get it right. So they finally found the, the real Toy Fook who was now going as George Key and he was in Portland uh, and he had uh, his certificate of residence that he he showed them, and he told them about his family. He said there were he said there were two boys and one girl, and that his brother's name was Toy Hing, and that his sister name his sister's name was Nook. So that was close to what the teacher thought. She thought it was Sook. So that that's pretty close. But his brother was older, and he was born in Pasadena. Toy Gao said that. He was uh, was born in 1887 in Oregon, and that would have made him nine years younger. So it's he couldn't have been the, the brother. Um, so George Key testified that he went to school in Jacksonville, and that his teacher was Miss Newberry, and that he knew this long list of people here and uh, and that his father was very well known too and he couldn't remember some of the the Chinese people that had testified for him uh, and he didn't recognize the photo of Toy Gao at all he didn't know who he was and when he was interviewed in Portland it was the first he knew that someone was saying that he was, they were his brother. Uh, he hadn't heard anything about it before. Um, he said he went back to China with his father and mother and sister through San Francisco sometime around 1890 and, uh, and that his father died in China and then he stayed in China for a couple years and then he came back through San Francisco with an uncle but he didn't name the uncle. So the conclusion was um, that the, by the inspector, that the testimony of Kenny and Elliot, who were the classmates, that they, um, it was conclusive to the identity of the real son of Toy Key. And Elliot also provided uh, the clue of the, the address of Toy Key in Portland. And the conclusion uh, from the testimony of, of the Chinese people was that um, Mr. Langle's information was ill-informed. Benson and Warden based their knowledge on the information that was supplied to them by Langle. So the information was not valuable or enlightening, but the Chinese testimony was important and, um, and it helped them figure out who the real uh, Toy Gao, Toy Fook was. So the inspector said that Toy Gao Fook was an imposter. So after two months in the detention center in Sumas, Toy Gao Fook was denied, denied admission to, into the United States but he was given the right to appeal. But he decided to return to China. That he didn't, he knew he didn't have a chance of getting in. So the questions I have are um, 
How did uh, Toy Gao plan this deception by himself? Did he have any help? I mean, it just seems like he knew a lot of information about a lot of people. It's just hard to know how he got it, and I don't think there's any way of ever knowing.